I want to let you all in on a secret. Now, for years, we've been bombarded in the news about the housing crisis. Now, the housing crisis talks about homelessness and housing affordability and overdevelopment. The housing crisis spans the spectrum of ooh, too much to ooh, not enough. But look, I think they're wrong. Now, having spent six years studying architecture and now working in residential design and development, I think our biggest problem is that architects and designers have forgotten about us, the people living in our homes. Now, if you look up home in a dictionary, you find two formal definitions. And I want you all to imagine both of these places. One, a place where one lives permanently. Or, two, an institution for people requiring permanent care. Now, how does your homes compare to a place for people requiring permanent care? I think we should throw out our dictionaries. And I definitely want architects and designers to throw out their dictionaries. Because at the core of it all, I think they've forgotten the purpose of a home. Instead, Verlin Klinkerborg describes a home in the Smithsonian Magazine as a home. And everything else is not a home. Now, this is the perfect definition because this recognises that home is synonymous with belonging. Now, Verlin further elaborates that a home is created through an organising of space. Architects and designers organise space to determine how we interact and respond to spaces. Architects and developers are designing our spaces so that they could create and bring to life this ideal world. Unfortunately, this ideal world has now become less about good design, but really just about selling property. Now, a lot of our designers are really driven by the needs of all the developers. And in many ways, they're looking and forgetting about the end user. They're designing properties as an asset class or a commodity. Now, in this country, we are obsessed with housing. Property, home ownership, the backyard with the hill's hoist. It's our castle. But as housing becomes more and more out of reach for the average Australian, we're starting to see the rise of the build to rent model. And with that to tackle housing affordability and undersupply, we now risk good design. Look, many architects resort to checker box design. And with that, we're looking at all the design requirements that say, our access to our homes stops on the outside of our front door. And with our architects and designers regulated by this checkbox system, they're neglecting us to the front porches of our homes. Instead of applying a long-term perspective, what we're seeing is a one-size-fits-all approach to design. And for the inside of our homes, instead of looking at the functionality of our homes. We're really driven just about aesthetics. Now, I think that we have lost good design. And if you want to challenge me, I've got a question. Why do we design as though we're invincible? Why do we design as though we will never age, never have an injury, never have a disability, not have to deal with being heavily pregnant, have young kids, or simply just to bring our shopping home. Now, a lot of architects and designers are told to design for the majority. And in designing for the majority, this was supposed to give the idea that 
we're all going to be able to have the greatest number of people using our buildings and spaces. But with this country rapidly growing, how do we really capture our majority and ultimately our diversity? The 2016 census found that 35.9% of households contained a person with a disability. That is one in three homes. And with an ageing population, that number will undoubtedly rise. Now, if home is home and everything else is not home, where do we belong if we don't have a right to a home? And if we're designing for a majority, well, clearly we are accepting that there is going to be a minority who shouldn't have access to that home. So who is that minority? Your grandparents, your family, or your friends? Last week I got into an Uber and we started talking about the weather, because that's what you do. <laughs> but eventually he asked me, what do you do? So I told him, I work for Summer Housing, and as an organisation, we aim to provide housing for people with significant disabilities so that they don't have to go and live in a residential aged care facility because there is simply no other option made available to them. He turned around, looked at me, and told me his story. As a young man, he knew he wanted to see Australia and he wanted to travel. Working in regional areas, he worked as a consultant to provide job opportunities to people on local farms. But his life changed when he had a serious accident. He woke up in a hospital and was told that he will was going to be a quadriplegic. Now, they then decided to move this young man who loved to travel into a nursing home. And every day he watched as those around him deteriorated and he was determined to leave. So much so that on the very first day he was able to get up on a walking frame, he pushed himself out through those front doors onto the first bus and called his parents to say, expect me home in eight hours just to escape a nursing home where everyone else around him was preparing to die. He was determined to live. So he found himself having left a nursing home only to then be homeless because he couldn't find something that he could actually live in where he was able to, with his disability, walk short distances and get into his own home. Today, after two years of job searching, the only job he's been able to find is to be an Uber driver, where he hires his own car and does what he can to make $70 a week, paying that above the average rent in his city, just so that he can get one small bedroom home with a lift so that he could get into his own apartment and into his shower by himself, a luxury he never had when he was in a nursing home. <coughs> now, for many others, this seems like an impossible dream. Today, at the peak of a housing boom, there are 6,200 young people living in residential aged care. Every year, an additional 200 people under the age of 50 are admitted. This doesn't even take into consideration those people who are stuck in hospital discharge, or even people who are just stuck at home because they can't get over a step. We talk about designing for a majority, but life is a random lottery, and no one in this room knows what tomorrow may bring. And if you think about it, whether it be through aging, injury or disability, we are this so-called minority. Every day I'm confronted by the reality of the lack 
of suitable housing for people with disability, whether they were born with a disability or if they were just simply crossing the road. And that's not good enough. And I hope that you can see that it's just not good enough. Because I want you all to consider what kind of a home you want to live in. A place that you belong, or a place for people requiring professional care. If we can provide housing for people with significant disabilities, then I don't see why, through good design, we can't solve our housing crisis. Because good design is for everyone, and everyone should feel like they belong. Thank you.